to moderate this um, panel of this afternoon on the topic of um, the new paradigm of the global company. And uh, the question alone already has two complicated buzzwords, paradigm, particularly new, and global. And so I'm very relieved that I have two distinguished um, leaders from the industrial world to discuss this topic with me and um, uh, give you some insight. Um, to my left is Mr. Schneider, the CEO of Fresenius. And um, to, my right, to my right is Mr. Fehrenbach, the chairman of um, Robert Bosch. Um, very much welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. In order to get um, a hopefully lively debate going between us and with you during the course, I will um, ask gentlemen to start with a little five-minute um, positioning on the topic before we enter into a debate. We'll start alphabetically. Mr. Fehrenbach, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Fischer. But before I start with my statement, I would like to thank you for the invitation to this panel. And I was here the first time in 2005, and I can compare other events at universities which I visited during my career. And uh, comparing this with what you are doing here in St. Gallen, it's amazing how much you have enhanced since 2005. And I want to give my congratulations to the organizing team. Congratulations for that. Yeah, to start the discussion on the role of global companies, I would like to share with you some of my perspectives I personally receive from various uh, groups about the role of the global companies. And I would like to mention four groups. Uh, first of all, university graduates. How do they see the global companies? How do our customers see the global companies? How do non-governmental organizations see it? And how the politicians? Let me start with the university graduates in Europe. If you look at employer rankings, the multinationals are always constantly at the top of the ranking. So graduates really like global companies. They like the opportunity to have a global career, inspiring working conditions they expect in these multinationals, and they, in our case also, they expect uh, to ha work at the cutting edge of the technologies. We Bosch are uh, the European champion in patents, and we have not a lot of issues to attract uh, graduates. But we see already quite a problem at the base of our suppliers. There we see already that they cannot attract enough uh, graduates from the universities, and this is very bad for us because we need a functional value-added cluster to be successful as, our, as a company. So you should not only look at the multinationals, they are also very good companies, mid-sized companies, which are on the technological side, very, very uh, good to join as an employer. If I look to the customers, no surprise, they appreciate very much that we are a global company because uh, they like a uh, supplier with a global footprint. In the automotive sector, Bosch is active in more than 120 different locations worldwide. And if I look overall to the Bosch groups, we are active in 150 countries. So wherever our customers go, in most cases, we are already there. Naturally, uh, the anti-globalization organizations they criticize the dark side of globalization, and maybe we'll get later on a question in this respect. And I agree, there are bad examples. Uh, there are unacceptable working conditions, abuse of natural resources, and a lack of ecological standards. And I have to say, some Western companies truly do not behave as a guest in these developing countries. And finally, the national governments take recently sometimes a very ambitious approach to global companies. Why? 
There is a growing anger because some multinationals have a very low tax rate because they sometimes shift their profits to low tax countries and they don't pay taxes at all in countries where they are active. In terms of risk hedging, the high export share of multinationals is always welcome for the public budgets as a stable income, even when the local economy is not showing too much growth. Germany is an excellent example for that. We are back in 2012 as the largest exporter in the world, uh, but this is not all welcomed by our European partners, as you know. In the midst of all of this, we have the global company, and with this term, everybody associates brands from the IT world like Apple, with very impressive growth rates and having, if, without having a physical footprint in the respective markets. But I'm convinced that consumer goods do not cover the full story of global companies. The know-how transfer via global companies, which happens while building an infrastructure, an industrial base in emerging markets, will eventually lead to a more balanced playing field in the triad. But competition is as tough as ever, and global companies are not immune against Schumpeter's creative destruction principle. The average time a company is part of Standard & Poor's 500 index of the biggest companies in the United States dropped from 90 years in 1935 to just 15 years in 1995. So the forces of change are partly te technological. On the other hand, national regulations might also change, and a strong position in the national market might turn very fast from an asset to a liability. The German Energiewende is a very good example for that. In summary, our business at Bosch, we don't see a completely new paradigm for doing business. We see essentially new opportunities. Thank you very much, Amber. Mr. Schneider. Thanks. Warm welcome, and uh, great to be back. Really enjoy the symposium a lot. This is a fantastic place and a fantastic event. Um, before I get to my opening statement, brief word on the company. Uh, Fresenius may not be a household word uh, to everyone. We're essentially a global healthcare group headquartered in Frankfurt, Germany. Our size is about $26 billion, um, and uh, we're about um, one-third in healthcare products, two-thirds in healthcare services, which tend to be very local. We are active in more than 100 countries, and we are stock quoted. And what is important is that one of our business segments, Fresenius Medical Care, in fact, has a dual uh, stock listing, one in Frankfurt, Germany, and uh, one in New York. So we operate with that business segment under full Sabine's Oxley oversight. Why that is important, I'll get to that later. In terms of my opening statement, uh, just one big, powerful observation, and that is running a multinational company certainly has not become easier the last two decades. Because you're essentially between a rock and a hard place. The rock is that global competition has ever intensified. In a day and age when, with your mobile phone, you take a photo of a product, and then your app on the phone tells you the best price for that product and also the best price for all competing products, there's no place to hide. You basically have a perfect efficient market, and that means pricing pressure. At the same time, from emerging markets, you have more and more low-cost competitors that are basically entering world markets after initially just serving uh, their home market. So in that day and age, either a commodity fully gets priced at a commodity price, you can't differentiate anymore by customer or by country, or you just have to innovate the hell out of it to differentiate your products, and that means more R&D spending, and also watching very tightly for R&D effectiveness. So that's the global side, and then the hard place is the local side, and the local side gets ever more demanding. Um, in the good old days, right after the war, when a multinational entered another country market, people usually would be very grateful about this, and they were seen in a very positive light. They would bring employment and technological progress uh, to that market. These days, you're essentially faced with a lot of skepticism. 
And you know, in some cases that may be earned and deserved, in other cases not, but it's harder and harder to satisfy all these national expectations and national requirements, and some of them go against the demands that you would have in order to be globally competitive. So let me bring up a few examples. Uh, one is local content rules. In many markets, whether they are hard laws or soft expectations, you have to manufacture locally to actually be in business for the service part as well. Um, that goes right against economies of scale because you can't manufacture every product in every country. I think that's obvious. Uh, second thing is uh, consider transfer pricing rules uh, for taxes. They have a purpose, absolutely, because otherwise all taxation would converge to the lowest tax jurisdiction. But these days, transfer pricing rules get ever more selfish, and they basically happen at the expense of other markets, so that as you look at some difficult countries, they're basically trying to capture tax revenue at the expense of all the other countries uh, that you're serving. And then last but not least, on financial reporting regulation, this goes back to our business segment, Fresenius Medical Care. Um, there was a lot of good effort to improve accounting accuracy after the corporate accounting scandals in 2001, 2002. I applaud all of that. The problem is none of this was coordinated between different countries. And so for a company like Fresenius Medical Care that is listed in Frankfurt and New York, it, it simply means this is all additive. You have to fulfill everything. No credit for doing it in one country um, for the regulation that comes from another country. So I've taken a slightly unusual measure about our annual report for Fresenius Medical Care. I've compared our 2001 annual report uh, to the one for 2012. The number of pages essentially has tripled and the weight has doubled. So with a sense of humor here, one conclusion is yes, we use cheaper paper. But um, frankly, can you imagine how much work that is and how much you're basically engaging in a multi-million dollar exercise year after year to fulfill all these requirements that want to accomplish essentially the same thing, but they're doing it in slightly different ways. And each and every page of those 390 pages needs to be checked and double checked because each of them includes a lot of legal liability. And that basically ultimately is expensive, both for fulfilling it or for missing it. So that's a new world. Uh, what are we going to do about it? A few thoughts. Uh, one is, for each business, be very selective about whether you go international. So as I look at our four business segments, for example, for the hospital business, we deliberately have chosen not to go international. Because once you cross borders, uh, you basically you make your business far more complex. And unless there's some corresponding advantage to going international, you better stay where you are. It's better to be profitable and national than to be unprofitable and global. Second thing is, if you do go global, make sure you do have an international corporate leadership team. You won't have people from every country in your leadership team, but it's enough to have some critical dialogue, some tolerance that's built into the system, and you only have that with some certain diversity when it comes to national backgrounds. In our case, the top 30 people, half of them have a different national background, they're not German, and um, I'm also proud to say not different European countries, basically uh, all, over, all over the world, different continents. Third one, for the local markets that we serve, we believe it's important to be as connected as possible to the local business environment, and that means the top person is always a local national, and we use expatriates very sparingly. A good example is China. We employ more than 6,000 people in China, yet um, the top management is entirely local Chinese. And when I count the expatriates, it's about a handful. We're mostly talking production engineers that basically help us to, to set up the manufacturing uh, equipment uh, in this country. And last but not least, I think you have to be very selective about what you coordinate on a global scale. Because when you look at global companies, at the end of the day, most people still fulfill a local task. And it's only very few people that actually provide the linkage between those different continents and that are capable of actually getting something done in a different location. It's a very scarce capacity. You have to use it for the highest value purpose. And to give you an example to the contrary, uh, let me tell you a story from the late 1990s, a US multinational, to be unnamed. Um, someone telling me that they spent in a global team two years with outside legal counsel and HR experts to agree on a global casual Friday dress down policy. God bless America, okay? 
That's certainly not the highest value use of global scarce capacity. So focus it on what counts. In our case, it is three powers reserved, integrity of financial reporting, quality, product quality, and finally, compliance. So th this is basically how we tackle that environment, but it's getting harder and harder by the day. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. OK, um, just to take you right up with the first question, um, a couple of points you were raising were implying to me that the question must be how global is the global economy, really, and how much does the old model that you have a nice, sophisticated, central product from your home market and roll it out over the world as a one-size-fits-all, does this work any longer? I don't think it works any longer because uh, there is a credible challenge coming from emerging markets. Emerging markets are no longer just the low-cost competitors. They also have a different way of looking at many of our products. And so at the end of the day, what you have to do, rather than having a highly centralized model, you have to distribute power. And you have to make sure that management capacity, R&D capacity, market intelligence actually gets spread out into various continents. So as I look at the true t t power bases in our company, it's not Frankfurt, Germany. There are really three of them. One is Hong Kong for all of Asia Pacific. One is Frankfurt for Europe, Africa, and South America. And one is Boston, essentially, for North America. And uh, between those three, I think you actually reduce a lot of complexity that happens at the regional level and then focus on the few items that are truly global. Thank you. Fernbach, if you look at um, the market, um, are you not afraid that a lot of the competitive advantage your product side offered and that you developed for a lot of money by rolling out internationally might get copied, um, come back to you, that um, uh, you get enough free access to the markets? Um, uh, how much risk is there actually that um, uh, the globalization of your company is actually feeding your new competitor? There is definitely a risk, that's for sure. And we have issues, uh, let's say, uh, with simple products. Let's say simple spark plugs or simple power tools. We have that risk. And, uh, but we have this not only because of we had the discussion before in regard of China. We don't have this only in China. We have this also in other countries, I want to say. But China is getting with 20 million vehicles a quarter of the total global market. Can you say that you are not going into that market because you have intellectual property issues? There's no chance. We on the automotive side have a clear strategy. In our cases, if you break down, for example, a fuel injection system in the different parts, you don't see the, really the issue behind it because the most knowledge is in the processes we have. And you cannot copy easily such processes. How do you can manufacture those tight tolerances you need in this? So our answer to this question, which constantly comes up, I have to say, you only can survive if you are always at the leading edge of the technology. Next question is, where do you develop this leading edge? We don't do this up till now in these countries. This is still mainly focused on Germany, because he, he is really our asset for the future success of the company. But in these countries is a mid-price segment developing. Mr. Schneider touched it briefly also. And for these products, you cannot have the development here in our industrialized countries, because you are not finding those solutions which these markets need. So in these cases, we transferred already the R&D, the engineering, to these countries because we would not be capable to meet the target prices for this mid-price segment. So we have to go with engineering into these countries. And for that, you have to develop a personnel system. How do you create a high loyalty to your company in these uh, countries? The attrition is still high on the low level, but you have to take very much care of your key persons. And for this, we developed a specific uh, personnel development system for them. Just a quick follow-up question. So far, the model has been that we, with our industrialized track record, yes. have brought ideas to these countries. Are you seeing the first signs of us importing ideas from over there? 
You know, if you think 20 years back, we just transferred the old generations of products we had to these countries. This you can forget today. You must nearly, you must basically transfer the same generation we have here in the industrialized countries also to these emerging markets in the meantime. Maybe there's a short time lag like of some years, not, not a lot. But in the meantime, just for this mid-price segment I touched, we see already now a reverse benefit which is coming back to us here in Europe. For example, uh, a famous example is the Tata Nano car. This car is not really a success in India, but this is due to other reasons. But in this 2,000 US dollar car, there is Bosch content of 200 US dollar. A very high content of Bosch is in that car, and everybody was wondering how this happened. We developed specific products for this car in India, and they came up with new ideas how to simplify our highly sophisticated products we have here in this market. And for example, the controller for a fuel injection system here in our country or in Germany, we have about five to 6,000 parameters to program in the controller. For the Tata Nano, 1,500 parameters were enough to make a good, smooth fuel injection system. And now we made it reverse to us, and in the meantime, we came with 3,000 parameters about for the developed countries with a controller for the fuel injection system. Yeah. So you see, these ideas are flowing back also here in the developed countries to come to new ideas how to simplify and to improve the product. So Schneider, one provocative question to you. As we are observing that the so-called emerging markets are actually getting very sophisticated developed markets, and you're yourself describing the challenges of a global company to increase your decentralization. Is the future really the global company, or might they all get more broken up into regional businesses who just interact rather than being integrated and centrally run at all? Well, I think it's still going to be global, but you have to be very sparing about what you do actually connect. Hence, break it down into regions and give a lot of power uh, to the front line. I think going back to the 80s and 90s, configurations were much more centralized, and I think you have to let go. And um, the internet gives us the illusion that we can actually run by remote control some faraway locations. That's okay for basically information going back and forth, but you'll never capture the richness of contacts, the richness of local reputation, knowing people, going for, to the same place for lunch, just immersing yourself in local life. Um, if you want to connect uh, with the local population the best possible way, you have to be there, and the person that is there needs to be empowered. If that person is seen as a puppet that runs basically everything by remote control from headquarters, no chance, no authority, no face, if you will. Just a quick follow-up. Um, I, I remembered from the last discussion the breakdown of authority. Ultimately, centrally run organizations, they are representing authority. So might it not really be that the future with the internet and the ability to network does not necessarily going to favor the large global company, but more a network of mid-sized, much more regional companies, maybe, against common wisdom today? Well, I think it depends on how much scale do you have in your underlying business. If there is scale, like either because of high R&D expenses or because it's very manufacturing cost sensitive, the product, then I think you still have pretty powerful forces that call for the company to remain global and to really just go for large volume uh, monolithic companies. Um, if you don't have those conditions and if you're operating in products and services that are highly local in their regulation, then I do actually think you're quite right. Um, the future is more in mid-sized companies that may be coordinated by ownership or overall policies, but they don't have to be coordinated and they may not be part of a global multinational company. Thank you. It depends very much on the market you are in. For example, in the automotive market, I don't expect that mid-sized company would, can compete with a global large companies because the economies of scales is, uh, has such an advantage that you cannot compete. But there are different uh, seg uh, segments. For example, we are active in packaging machinery, and the packaging machinery segment in China or in India is totally different from what we have in the industrialized countries. So there, 
our competitors are in reality mid-sized companies. Yeah. So it's a mix and it depends very much on the market you are in. Imbach, just let me pick up on one of the points you remarked. You were talking about the famous German Energiewende, yeah. Germany, the heart of uh, European industrial strength. Um, has an energy vendor that uh, is propelling up the energy costs. And if I look at today's world and read the papers, then Shell Gas is leading to gas in the US priced at $4 a cubic meter compared to $10 or $12 in Europe. And on that, we add the cost of the energy vendor. Mm. Is that um, uh, a smart model for us to stay competitive? Yeah. First of all, I really welcome that... Uh the US is coming back on the industrial side because I was very much afraid that we concentrate too much of our assets to China. We put already too many eggs in the Chinese basket. And uh, if you follow what uh, Daimler, Audi, BMW are doing, because they are depending on the premium side already much too much on China, but they increase also their investment into the United States, and with this new energy wave in the United States and talking to other CEOs, American CEOs, they are convinced that the industrialization of the US is coming back, the reindustrialization, where they still have some kind of knowledge. Some industry segments are gone. You cannot bring them up easily. But in the other side, like in, in the chemical side and so on, I'm sure they will be the strongest competitor, for example, to BASF here. And uh, I very much welcome if the reindustrialization in the US is happening, because then we have another much stronger region where we can balance the global markets much better. Um, Schneider, just because you have also an American passport, as far as I can see from your badge, and um, your company is very, very strong with the long tradition in the US market. Um, looking at the huge new competitive advantage that the energy market seems to give the US, that for me, I have to say, I'm still an old-fashioned believer in the American model of freedom and free entrepreneurship. Um, we all already declared the 21st century to be China. That might be true. But um, given my bad uh, 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 smoking habits, my life expectancy isn't that long in the 21st century. So for my next 10 to 15 years, might we not see the big recovery of the US? I think we will. And uh, yes, my personal motto is never, ever go short in the United States, because <laughs> ultimately you lose. Um, <laughs> and it is true, uh, a lot has to do with the principles you mentioned, and that's freedom, entrepreneurship, and embracing new opportunities fast. I mean, this shale gas thing has been going on for a decade now. We may not have noticed it, but it's been developed like this. And uh, we're still debating about the pros and cons. But it's happening, and it's making U.S. industrial production cheaper. And uh, meanwhile, with our decisions in Germany, with German energy policy, we're making industrial production more expensive. And we're not even having an honest debate about it, because all we talk about is whether the energy bill for consumers is going up or not. We're not talking about whether that consumer is still going to be having a job because energy prices are going up and that means manufacturing jobs eventually will get pushed out of the country, no question about it. Now, a lot's been made about the US and China and who's number one and number two, and honestly, the world is big enough for both. So there's upside for both of those regions um, and it's useless, in my opinion, to pinpoint about when one country is number one, two, or three, or when it'll eclipse another country. I think there's enough upside for both of these uh, territories, and there's good reason to be bullish on both of them. Well, I mean, I don't make any secret on my personal big bullishness on the US, but I would be curious how you, as the leader of a global company, looks at a completely different market um, like Africa, with the change in the um, global value of um, uh, raw materials and the big investments that, in particular, China has made in infrastructure over there. Does this market start to play a role for you for the next 10, 15 years? We have some business in Africa. It's growing double-digit, but it's growing double-digit from an extremely low base. And honestly, it's been tough going. And uh, in my mind, Africa mostly is a raw materials story. 
what I'm not seeing in Africa, as opposed to Asia or Latin America, is this virtuous cycle where you do have a rising middle class, you do have improving education levels, you do have um, uh, more local manufacturing happening. Um, that's where ultimately, you know, uh, things will get uh, resilient, uh, where there's some uh, sustainability to development. It's not just depending then on raw materials prices. That sort of thing, with very few exceptions, we have not seen yet in Africa. And also, we have not seen the corresponding long-term long improvements uh, in healthcare spending. We have seen it in Asia. We have seen it in Latin America. Africa, at some point, may be on the horizon as well, but it's just not there yet. Thank you, Feyenbach. I mean, um, I think we see that, um, let's say, gas and cheap oil gives America a second chance. Um, we all know that um, Asia, with its um, incredible um, performance-driven value system, is someone one has to reckon with. What is with us good old Europeans? Are we going to run more than a museum in 10 mm -hmm. years? Don't, re don't reduce America only to gas and uh, <laughs> fracking and so on. <laughs> I think you have also to see that uh, the labor cost in China, at, le at least at, along the East Coast, increased a lot. Uh, 15 years ago, the relationship between labor costs in China and the US was 1 to 20, and now it's 1 to 4. So when you today calculate products, you are sometimes very close to the Chinese manufacturing costs. So there is, has also something changed, I wanted to add to, to your argument of very cheap much. oil and... and, and so. <laughs> I'm always trying to say okay. that. <laughs> I'm just a banker, you know, <laughs> it's two complex things up beyond. Yeah. <laughs> your question. Well, but, but the question was another simple one, actually very <laughs> much simplified. Is there, a, 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 what is going to be Europe's role yeah. more than being a good museum for the rest of the yeah. world? Uh, this is right now really my major concern. If we look at Europe, I think we have to take in consideration that maybe we see a 10 year of stagnation in Europe. A 10 year? 10 year of stagnation. Uh, if I were a student here, I would listen to that very carefully. <laughs> and if you, if you think as a global company, making the bridge to the global company, you have to stay competitive on a global base. For that, you have to improve your productivity here also between three and 5%. And on a stable economic development, this means very much reducing of the workforce in Europe. If we don't come up with new ideas, how do we manage a company in such a region? Uh, the demographic issue we have on top of that. Uh, we don't see a big hope was Russia for a long time. We thought Russia would much more industrialize and not living only from the raw materials they have, from the oil and the gas. So looking at that, this is my major concern right now, the stagnation in Europe. I think we will see a recovery of the US that helps us to balance to the, to the Asian market. But what are we doing? And we have our strong base here in Europe, and we have our knowledge here. We cannot afford this. This is right now the biggest task we have in our company at Bosch, and we are working on that. Can we come can, can up with new product ideas? in this getting uh, older uh, society? Uh, can we come up with uh, the next step in technology development? Can we be the leader in the integration software and hardware uh, products? Not only concentrate on the German machinebau, but add to the machinebau also the software solution on top of it. I think we have to concentrate on that. And I would say, Germany really needs, or Europe needs, an Agenda 2020. How do we feed our, our people in 2020? What kind of work do we provide to them? This is an issue which is right now on the table. Well, we already have had five years of stagnation. If you add another yeah. 10 to it... Um, but I we can... thought it goes up and came back and goes back to normal and does not go back to normal. The Japan had 20 and that had a huge impact on society and yep. everything. That, yep. that, that is a very strong statement to yep. make with yep. big implications. Um, uh, if, 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 you, if you look at that, I mean, you're still, I mean, very strong, our European-based company. You know, the medical sector has its own 
um, uh, well, let's say demand cycle, for which uh, aging is actually not the worst <laughs> demand driver. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, you, you have uh, as well a pessimistic outlook on the next decade for, for Europe? Certainly muted. And let me build on your earlier point about the students. Yes, uh, call your travel agent and get yourself that one-way ticket to either America, Asia, South America, Africa. It doesn't matter. But for a while, get out of here. That's because to the students, right? That's to the students. You hear? And it's Very not clear. about being pessimistic on Europe alone. It's simply about giving you a choice. And even if you choose to come back, you'll come back a more interesting, more diverse person. Just do it. Um, but aside from that, in terms of healthcare, yes. Some of the very things that are a challenge to an industrial society, like an aging population, of course, when you look at healthcare, present themselves as an opportunity. So the fact that we have our hospitals in Germany where you will have the steepest demographic challenge over the next two decades is a good thing. So it doesn't necessarily hinder us. But in the parts of our business that are more industrial, we have to think the same way, and that is where are we ultimately making things for the global market? And either we keep an innovation edge in Europe, or we have to follow uh, the trail of everyone else uh, to North America, to China, to some other markets that are either offering lower manufacturing costs, more ingenuity, um, uh, better manufacturing environment, uh, better energy cost. So this is the kind of crossroads we're facing, and it is a serious problem for Europe. And uh, I do believe that, yes, we are already having five difficult years behind ourselves. And yes, it'll look like, it looks like it may be another five to ten years. Working analogies here, this is not too dissimilar to the, too dissimilar to the 1970s. Because at the end of the day, you know, coming out of the 60s with a hangover, it took more or less 12 to 15 years to work through some of these issues. And we had a decade full of volatility, unsuspected, political surprises and, uh, and market swings that were unforeseen. And we're into something that, of course, history never repeats itself, but it rhymes. And I think we're right now in one of those periods uh, that looks and feels a little like the 1970s. Just a little bit of a half-joking follow-up question. Would you give a 50-year-old man like me the same advice? One-way tickets are always good. Okay, I keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, two last questions before I open um, um, our debate to the, uh, to the floor. Zevenbach, um, uh, the overall topic of um, this um, gathering here is courage and um, courage in leadership. Um, when I read the papers, um, almost in any of the Western European countries, I get the impression that um, it's mainly lawyers, compliance officers, um, a lot of, I don't, uh, what, I don't know how we used to call them, but memos that protect certain parts of your body, and um, things like that. I don't see that there is much of an incentive any longer for courage and leadership in large organizations. Are we overshooting? Are we actually having great seminars talking about courage, but we're not rewarding it any longer? I think you have to differentiate what we are doing in the company. We are rewarding very much uh, courage. And uh, we think constantly about how can we improve the rewards for courage. But what concerns me much more is the bureaucratic side. You touched on it, and Mr. Schneider touched it also in his opening statement, that we are getting more and more uh, regulations on the bureaucratic side. And uh, our annual report is not as thick as yours, but it's also too thick already, I can tell you. But we are not a public company, so I have a little bit of different uh, situation at Bosch. But what concerns me in this respect also is, when you look to the answers to the questionnaires in, re in the direction of the Generation Y, I, I'm very much afraid when I see these answers that so only a few of them want to be in the future in the leading position, in a leading charging position, they want the highest ranking right now has the work-life balance. They want to have a good life balance. Uh, in, that is the highest target they have. And if I then look at the same time on the competitive edge we have against our competitors in Asia Pacific, how should we stay upfront in the competition worldwide. This is a major concern. So, and I'm, I'm sure it's not true for St. Gallen here, there we have a different generation Y, uh, hopefully, but in Germany right now, there is a discussion of that we wanted to have a well-being republic, and 
society, I think this cannot be really the target. Considering the 10 year stagnation we talked before, I think we have to stay competitive, and for that we need a, a, a generation Y who also takes over the, the responsibility and has a lot of courage in this respect. Thank you. Obviously, the students in St. Gallen only have a work and no life balance. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good thing, by the way. If you ever hear a CEO talk about work-life balance, frankly, sell the stock. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm not going to ask you then about your work-life balance. I'm going <laughs> to go direct into um, uh, uh, the um, courage question also. Um, courage is also, as was said, swimming against the tide. And swimming against the tide means making decisions that might not look right today. Isn't it very hard for the CEO of a public-listed company with journalists, shareholders, everyone looking over your shoulder, everyone knowing better, to make decisions which might be right, but you won't look good for the next two years? Excellent question. And here's a particular challenge that a public company has. I think you have to be realistic about what a public company is good at. And in the eyes of a stockholder, a public company is a great vehicle to take a business that's already existing and scale it up, which is usually a fairly predictable process. A public vehicle is usually not a good idea for a startup, hence you've got something like entrepreneurs or venture capital. And a public vehicle is also not a good format if you're in a deep corporate um, reinvention uh, when everything's changing. Uh, because then usually there's so much mistrust from the outside uh, that you get punished in terms of the evaluations. And for those situations, you have vehicles like private equity uh, to reinvent a company and then let it out uh, into the stock market later again. So I think with the public company, you need to be, of course, embracing innovation. You've got to take risks, but you have to be always sure that those risks are in some relationship to the existing business and that the risks don't take over. Because at some point then, the price you're paying in terms of lower valuations is just not simply worth it anymore. So there's a delicate balance. But uh, we do encourage our people to go out and do take risks. Uh, don't repeat them unnecessarily, but be proud of the risks you're taking, even if things don't work out. And just be sure that the risks are not bet the farm type risks and that there's some proper controls and learnings from everything you're doing. But by and large, it's important to be realistic about what a public company can do. If someone tells you, today I'm this and tomorrow I'm something totally different, that's not realistic, at least not if you're in a public company format. Uh, that's simply the price of having many different stockholders that can only spend a little bit of time, each person, in understanding all the elements of that change. A private equity shareholder can do this, a startup venture capitalist can do this, an individual entrepreneur can do this, but for public shareholders, they want a certain degree of predictability. Well, I would like to open the floor now um, uh, and uh, ask for your questions. I start with the lady right in front of me. Hello, my name is Pretty from Botswana. I would like to address this to Mr. Schneider. I would like to just correct something you made, a point you made about Africa's middle class not growing enough. And uh, I just want to note that there are several reports that are indicating that Africa's middle class is growing and has actually tripled. And uh, there are predictions that uh, it's going by the rate of 42%. Uh, and uh, I just want to know from you that, uh, did, do you read a lot of these reports? Are you considering them? The reason why I'm saying this is because uh, we tend to paint everything with the same brush, and uh, there tends to be this uh, Afro-pessimism and negative perception, which has, uh, over time, actually affected the social and the economic and the political development of Africa. And mostly, uh, this affects the flow of FDI to the continent. And so I just wanted to pass that to you, sir, to say, have you considered this? And as uh, an investor, what's your take on this? Yeah, look, absolutely, point taken. And sorry, I didn't want to um, offend any feelings here. And yes, we're talking here at the 50,000 foot level, which is a little bit like uh, what I call the CNN weather report. Like, you know, South Africa needs some rain, China has sun. Uh, we all know that actually when you go to the micro level, things are much more differentiated. And yes, we are investing in Africa, and I do read the reports, but yet, We've got to be realistic. Compared to what's going on in Asia Pacific and compared to what's going on in Latin America, the absolute numbers and the size of the opportunity pales in comparison. 
And that's just an area we need to be realistic about, and that's the way it is. At least that's our take on the data we've seen. Uh, we do invest there, but if I have a chance uh, to put down a larger investment in Asia Pacific or Latin America, yes, that does take preference. But that's also obviously because, as you said, the absolute numbers are so high in these markets. From a pure opportunity point of view, also for the ones who are looking for the one-way tickets, I personally believe that Africa is seeing its dawn and it's also one of these places where you can make a huge difference now um, uh, and uh, is an underestimated place, I think. But obviously, the absolute numbers are naturally very, very low still. So it will take a bit of time up for, and when you get the full attention on the radar screen of global companies. But the day will come, I'm sure of that. Well, we can all agree that courage on these markets will get rewarded sooner or later. So consider it for your one-way tickets. More qu please. Uh, now I go to the back. G gentleman in the back, there was the hand so far up. Yes, you're waving. Hello, my, my name is Wolfgang Gründinger. I'm a writer based in Berlin. Uh, Mr. Fehrenbach, um, don't worry that the young generation is not willing to take responsibility. We are highly willing to take responsibility, but we don't want to have jobs that only make money. We want to have jobs that make sense. Having said this, I was delighted. I was delighted to hear. So having said this, I was delighted to hear your opinion that large corporations should take social responsibility. And thus, I want to ask you um, if you think that large corporations should engage in a public, transparent, and fair dialogue with citizens, and if they should follow the example of Puma um, in sustainability accounting. And my second question is, um, since the issue of the energy transition in Germany popped up several times at the panel, um, you talked a bit about the, the shale gas in the US. Um, if you could elaborate a bit more about the German energy transition itself and how Bosch is positioning here in the energy market. Hmm. The answer is clear that uh, the large corporations have to take uh, over a lot of responsibility. And uh, for example, in my company, we have a clear rule. All the regulation and principles we apply, for example, in our operations in Germany, we apply also in the emerging markets. On the quality side, on the environmental side, on the factories. If you go to a factory in China and compare it to a factory of Bosch in Germany, you will see no difference. Maybe one, because they are newer, they are even more, more polished. So there is no difference, and this is a basic company rule. And I think with this rule, we transfer so many things in these countries and make it aware to the, to the people in the country that this is an example also for the politicians to look at it and they get under the pressure if they compare our operations with other operations and the pressure will increase in these countries. And I see this to bring over our principles into these countries as the highest responsibility I have in these countries not more and not less. I think, yes, we can talk about human rights from the morning to the evening, but then if I say, as consequence, I do not make business in China, I'm out of business and I will lose the base, the business base for my 300,000 associates at Bosch. This is not a solution. We only can work with them and demonstrate that there is another way of doing business compared to, to, to a, a better, a worse way. So you are Thank you. Your question in regard of uh, uh, fracking and shell gas, we are not in that business uh, at all. Uh, but let's say maybe you have recognized that we invested some years back into photovoltaic, uh, crystalline photovoltaic. And at that time, even though Mr. Schneider says, yes, fracking was known since 10 years, but we didn't see five years ago that this will be had such an impact as it has right now. And at that time, we did not see that uh, the gas costs and the gas prices are going so much down that, for example, the renewable energies in the United States will be dead for some years because there will be no, no return on capital to invest in renewables because of this uh, cheap gas and also of this uh, shell oil. Uh, if you, your question was related to environmental issues, uh, at the beginning I was very, very skeptical, 
because they did not uh, put on the table what kind of chemicals they use. In the meantime, they put this on the table of the EPA, and I know the EPA out of the automotive side, they are very critical, very precise, they have allowed this uh, fracking in the US, and by the way, in Germany, we use fracking since many, many years in the vertical side. We don't use it on, on the horizontal side. But fracking is not so new in Germany. But I think we have even problem to get accepted a pilot project to try it out, what are the impacts and so on. If we stay on this situation, you will see a lot of disadvantages for the European industry because we will get under pressure from competitive prices out of the United States. I think we have to rethink, rethink <coughs> there our position. Next question. Um, the lady um, there. I'm Christiane Riff from Germany. I have two questions uh, concerning the same issue. Um, the first question is, how do you bring together your sustainability reports with this fracking euphoria? I mean, it's, it's not only a Bosch issue, it's an issue of the whole society that there's a kind of schizophrenia here. That's my first question. And then I would like to um, elaborate a, 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 an opposite theory about energy prices. I think you could also say that high prices have made um, people creative that most uh, of, uh, at least a, a large part of the German export industry nowadays is uh, efficiency technologies, it's uh, energy technologies that partly have been, uh, came up by high energy prices. So couldn't you see things from that side as well? And could it be that you may regret in a few years that you went out of photo photovoltaics? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sustainability to link it, uh with this fracking issue, I said we should at least allow to make some pilot projects to find out what is the impact on the environment before we say on a theoretical base, no. CO2 emissions? Yeah, but fracking is not the real major source of CO2 emissions. There are much other examples where you could reduce CO2 emissions. Think about the heating system in our houses, which are much, much older. 40% of the CO2 emission comes out of uh, two old uh, heating systems we have in our houses. So you can save a lot more CO2 emissions, not in the fracking uh, technology. But coming back to your question uh, in regard of uh, photovoltaic. Uh, the situation in the photovoltaic mark is as follows. Right now we have a capacity worldwide installed of 60 gigawatt, watt peak worldwide on photovoltaic. The world demand is 30 gigawatt. So we have already installed the double capacity of what the world needs on the photovoltaic side. And in the last two years, the prices on the solar modules went down by 40% every year. So this price development destroyed the total industry here in Europe. And we have to wait till we come up with new photovoltaic technologies, which then can meet these lower target prices again. With a crystalline photovoltaic, you will not meet the market prices any longer. And for therefore, it gave no other choices for us than to go out of business right now. It was an excellent example how you can destroy an industry by the wrong substitution in the market. Um, two quick questions, and then we have to come to an end. I think gentlemen over here, and uh, I see I was, no, we start then with you. Thank you very much. One question. Why are you a public company, and what is the f fact that you are a public company? Any helpful in this big debate of stakeholder and management? Because uh, Bosch is not a public company. So have you ever thought of company. getting out of the market? <laughs> I think when you look at the opportunity that's in front of us in healthcare, um, and this is a pretty American term here, this is like the Oklahoma land run of 1889. It's a huge opportunity, and there's no other way to finance expansion in that market than to use public equity. Uh, 
at some point you run out of private money, at some point you run out of uh, debt capacity. There's no other way. Um, as you see, I mean, this is the largest industry on the globe. Uh, it is still growing with demographic challenges and it is super fragmented and consolidating at the same time. So if you want to make the best of that opportunity, you better have a public equity background and have the flexibility to raise equity as needed. We do that sparingly. We use debt first because debt is always the cheaper form of growth capital, but at the end of the day, there's no replacement for it. And so with all the limitations I mentioned before about public companies, um, nonetheless, when it comes to large amounts of capital over long periods of time, there is no replacement. We've bought lots of companies from founders that ultimately ran into su succession problems. Most family companies at some point run into a succession issue. Private equity has a limited time horizon. So at the end of the day, when you look at the large historic industrial or service corporations, most of them do have a public equity background and I think for good reasons. Thank you. I, I was just reminded that we are overrunning, so I have I come to an end and would like to um, uh, ask you gentlemen to um, <coughs> say just in two or three sentences what from your personal point of view, view would be the one thing as a leader of a global company that could take your sleep if you were the kind of person who would lose sleep over anything. Right now it's clearly the differentiation we have to manage. On the one side, we have a stagnating home market where we need qualitative, qualitative growth with new products, new technology, and at the same time, we have to take the chances and the opportunities in these fast-growing emerging markets. And to manage this within the same company, this is quite a challenge and uh, on which I have to think about also at night. Thank you. My biggest concern goes right back to the theme of this symposium, and that's rewarding courage. Um, I do think in the 80s and 90s, we did have a very good environment for global capitalism, where we truly let the tiger out of the tank. And there were some developments that, in hindsight, we regretted, and they led to where we are today. But we're now at the opposite end of the spectrum, and that is systematically stamping out risk-taking and entrepreneurialism and freedom and uh, the reward structure that goes with it. And by doing that, uh, we run the risk of turning multinational companies right back to what I think they were coming out of the 60s into the 70s, and that is large quasi-public institutions run with no upside in mind, simply self-perpetuating, but not taking risks, not really doing anything new, and, uh, and certainly not expansion-minded. And um, now, it is important, after what has happened, to learn, learn the lessons from it. This goes back to what I said earlier. We made mistakes, let's learn from the mistakes, let's not do them again. But we have to find the right balance between having courage and rewarding it, and at the same time having some safeguards to be sure we don't run out of bounds again. Uh, right now, we're not doing a terribly good job in finding that balance. I hope the public debate will swing back to center because I think what's at stake is the competitiveness of multinational companies. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Schneider. Thank you, Mr. Fernbach, for your clear and open remarks. Uh, I wish all of you um, a great ending, I think, today of the symposium and a wonderful weekend.